All right, uh, I am Dr. Charles Woods. I'm Dr. Gavin Johnson. And we are presenting our presentation today, Beyond Surveillance Apathy, Considering the Importance of Privacy When Using AI and Other Classroom Technologies. So, we'd like to begin with the terms of service for this workshop. Um, this workshop is for educational purposes only. By remaining in this workshop, you agree to consider the importance of privacy in relation to artificial intelligence and other technologies that we may use in our classrooms. You acknowledge that Dr. Charles Woods and Dr. Gavin Johnson are experts in digital cultural rhetorics and rhetorical privacy and surveillance studies, but not experts in cybersecurity. Therefore, the content of this workshop focuses on cultures, genres, and literacies of privacy in relation to digital learning technologies. We will not collect cookies without your consent, though we do like fresh bait. <laughs> and we will not collect or sell your data. We may collect your feedback to help develop this workshop for the future. Um, Finally, you acknowledge that this is just the beginning of a conversation that will continue to evolve as technology evolves, and you will do your best to work against privacy apathy in your classrooms and your own technology use. Do you consent to the terms of agreement for the presentation? Yes, okay, everyone in the crowd consented to the terms of service. So why now? We're giving this presentation because of the introduction and rapid expansion of generative AI tools for public consumption. They're changing laws regarding privacy at local, state, and international levels. Certainly, this is a topic here in Texas. We have Governor Abbott's Cybersecurity Directive colloquially referred to as the TikTok ban, which was effective in 2023. In California, they have the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, which became effective in 2020. And then abroad, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which governs citizens in EU countries. Of course, the GDPR uh, building on the long line uh, from the data directive over the last 30 years of the EU protecting their citizens' digital privacy. In America, there are no federal laws specifically regulating the collection, aggregation, and commodification or use of data generated by users online. For the most part, it's a state issue. And we like to talk about surveillance and privacy as a continuum, not a binary. And we like to really focus on how they inform each other and how it is contextually determined. So privacy is a spectrum and not in opposition to surveillance. Um, and really our ethics um, and our individual kind of desires and needs and concerns are what guide how we think about privacy, how we position privacy. What I think is good privacy for my data might not be what Charles thinks is good privacy for his data. And part of why this is such an important um, topic right now is that you know, it's not news that we are surrounded by technology at all times. It's not news that um, we have multiple devices that are tracking us just on our bodies at any time. Right. Um, and this phenomenon, uh, which was kind of noticed at the turn of the new millennium, so around 2000 or so, has been termed new surveillance. And it refers to the ubiquity of digital technologies, such as biometrics, like DNA analysis and wearables. I'm being tracked right now. Uh, <laughs> infrastructure, such as GPS, traffic cameras, and home security systems as well as emerging uh, technologies um, such as facial recognition and AI. And by emerging here, we don't mean that the technology is new, but that the public facing uh, technology is growing, emerging, mm -hmm. such as um, ChatGPT. 
So privacy policies um, are a genre that we think of when we are thinking about um, how a company will tell you how they <laughs> protect your privacy. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, what's interesting about these is that they are part of a cluster of documents. It's not only a privacy policy, but also terms of service and a, a larger kind of set of policies that work together to kind of make um, individual frameworks for po uh, privacy and surveillance. Oftentimes, privacy policies protect users while terms of use documents protect companies. So different audiences for different purposes. And the potential genre for examination in course assignments across disciplines. Because all of our disciplines are using technologies and that are built into our courses um, or that we bring into our courses, we can and should use the, some of the time to wor work with students and talk about how their data is being collected and used in our classrooms. As we've argued elsewhere, privacy policies are the most influential genre in the world. We just don't read them, right? As the icon says. <laughs> <clears throat> so, how can we dig in and do this tedious work? How can we sit and read a jargon-filled, legalese-filled, six-page document? I'm already bored just thinking about it, all right? So we came up with some, a framework for analysis, and this is building on some work I did in dissertations and publications, and work with Dr. Johnson to kind of extend where we can look at and what we can look at in a privacy policy. So here's what we've come up with. Temporality is an important question to ask when analyzing a privacy policy or another terms of service document. We need to know when was the last time the policy was updated. And if you're reviewing a cluster of policies, does the, do, the, uh, do those policies updates align with one another, right, temporarily? So that's an important thing to consider, especially when we think about changing laws locally, right, geolocation matters. When a policy was last updated, matters. Transparency. When we think about transparency, we might think about information, is information presented ethically? Now you see that word efficiency, like a tech comm term, right? But we can also think about thoroughness and honesty, uh, potentially being explicit about what third parties, right? A company or an organization uh, works with, uh, with uh, data. Uh, another uh, is language, thinking through language use, jargon, legalese, complex concepts. How are these presented? Why are they presented in this way? Um, these three, temporality, transparency, and language, we can kind of see as lower order things that we can get into really simplistically without ever having to understand all the nuances of digital data collection, right? Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the next ones, and then we'll talk about design together? Sure. Um, so the next set are the higher order concerns and really thinking about um, privacy and surveillance on a more technical level. Um, you need a little bit more knowledge to be able to analyze a policy from these, um, these, point, these elements. And so that includes digital surveillance, being able to identify what kind of cyber security measures are in place what kind of cookies are a, is a, um, a website pulling from you? Are those cookies encrypted? Can you opt out of them? What are, what's possible? You have to know what a cookie is. <laughs> um, and fresh baked, a, right? <laughs> not fresh baked, even though that's an icon that is often used right. as a chocolate chip cookie. Um, cookies aren't as pleasant as fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. Uh, data usage, identify third parties, identify processes of data collection, aggregation, and commodification. Because technologies link into each other, we're always, you know, uh, we're, help me out, Charles. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're all integrated into like each other, right? So right. understanding how to use one technology really requires understanding the implications of that technology's use in relation to other technologies, yes. right? And meaningful access, which we think is probably one of the most important yeah. aspects here. And when we talk about meaningful access, we don't just mean access to the technology 
or the ability to um, turn it on. But access in a way that means that the user can actually produce what they're going to produce out of the technology without, um, without fear that they are illiterate or thinking in terms that are not um, not correct. I yeah. mean, truly able to understand like the long-term implications, right? Yes. Short and long-term implications of that of that technology and its use. And then we are we actually just wrapped up uh, a publication <laughs> extending this framework to talk about the issue of design. Yes. And design here is looking at the choices made when presenting a privacy policy. You know, how is it given to you? Is it a big block of text? Is it broken up? Are there bullet points? Is it hyperlinked across multiple documents? Do they give you a video? We haven't found one with a video yet. Not yet, but I think it's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> um, or do they have a large kind of privacy infrastructure that they made transparent to you? Or do they hide it all? Yeah. Um, and so we're really interested in this issue of design and what it tells us about some of these other concepts. How can design and temporality work together? Well, right. are they telling you where the data is? Like, is it at the top of the policy? Easy enough. But then when we get to the design of digital surveillance and thinking about cookies, well, if I put a little icon of a chocolate chip cookie, what does that tell a user? Does it just tell them, hey, this thing is called a cookie, and you can just think of fun, fresh baked right. ones, when they really should be digging in and thinking about what data is being stored here and, and what technologies are tracking them across uh, websites and other tech. Absolutely. A cookie icon isn't enough anymore, right? No. I need a chart. <laughs> Whole menu. So uh, with this framework in mind, we've worked through the chat GPT privacy policy. Um, and some, some of the things we found are surprising. Uh, when we worked through it, uh, of course, this is a recorded thing, right? So when we worked through it, um, the policy was last day updated on June 23rd, 2023. Um, well, that seems to be a, a bit of time now, uh, five or six months. And that's just too short when we think about the evolution of this artificial intelligence technology. It's too long a gap. They really need to be updated almost monthly, mm -hmm. or when necessarily, based on changing laws, right? Uh, we reviewed the po privacy policy for OpenAI, and remember Dr. Johnson mentioned a moment ago, privacy policies in terms of use documents are a little bit different. This uh, privacy policy for OpenAI, of course, OpenAI being the company who publishes the privacy policy for, uh, uh, for ChatGPT, right? Uh, the document which protects the company. And so the terms of use was last updated on March 14th, 2023. So the document that protects users was updated in March and the document was, that protects the company was updated in June. Why do these updates not align? What could have possibly changed that impacted only one of the stakeholders in this relationship? I don't, I don't know what that could be. <laughs> but it's a question worth asking. We also uh, thought about uh, transparency and really thinking about what is available for us to see, easily see. So transparency is also about its purposes, which builds ethos, credibility, and establishes trust between the company and the user. Um, one of the uh, technologies that we just did analysis on for our work is a pretty famous company that makes a big deal about how much it protects user privacy. It's all over their products, it's all over their advertisements, they have a whole privacy center built into their website. Um, so they are practicing kind of this rhetoric of transparency, like we are showing you everything you need to know, but then as you dig in, you realize that they're not showing you everything you need to know for um, to to understand where your data is going. Right. And the transparency also asks if it provides, a, I keep coming back to cookies, 
I'm the one who got cookies today. <laughs> uh, provides a definition of cookies at an appropriate time, but buries information about the types of cookies and models of tracking used in another document available via hyperlink. Right. And this via hyperlink thing is something that Dr. Woods and I have been thinking about a lot mm -hmm. because especially with the advent of like Web 2.0, we've we got really, really comfortable with the idea of hyperlink and what it allows. It means that you don't have to put everything in one spot. But at this point, as we move forward, now we're kind of suffocated by hyperlinks. There's a hyperlink everywhere and there's no actual information in front of you. It becomes a wild goose chase across hyperlinks mm -hmm. and different documents, right? And that's something we want to work against as a principle of transparency. So language. Um, so this is this is uh, this is not a point everyone's going to agree with. Certainly, people have <laughs> found their way into my inboxes and saying you're wrong about this. Um, common misconception is that privacy policies are filled with jargon and legalese, and they certainly are. One example might be to point to uh, language protecting children. Certainly, under the age, users under the age of 13 in digital spaces is worked into every privacy policy. But I would argue that for the most part, privacy policies are pretty readable. Like, you can read it. I mean, you won't understand everything in it, but it's readable. And I think that that's different than comprehension. Details, relationships. Uh, when we think about language, we can think about the details of relationships with third parties throughout. Uh, in the open, a open AI privacy policy, the policy does not define third parties until section seven, which I think is very late in a privacy policy. Um, Understanding these relationships is important early on. Uh, this point about third parties, you'll, you've, you've heard us say that before. You know, that's one thing that we see as a part of being transparent through language choices, right? Um, section three of the open AI privacy policy, when we're analyzing for language, we'll see that section three says, it explains data will be shared if required by law or in good faith, but does not define good faith nor de who decides what a good faith action is. Now, certainly we could point to um, like a big tech company or an ed tech company. We can look to their chief technology officer should be the person defining like what, what that means. But what we need to also account for is that what good faith means differs greatly across users, let alone communities and cultures, right? And so we have to reconcile that in these privacy policies if we're going to, uh, when it comes to data collection. Uh, and then finally, oh, this is a big one. Uh, when we um, did this uh, analysis, the word consent is used, it's mentioned six times in this updated version of the po privacy policy. Uh, up from one mentioned previously, and I'll just elaborate a little bit on that. So when ChatGPT came out and it was introduced in uh, November of 2022, um, we did an analysis, we were invited to talk and we did an analysis of the privacy policy and the word consent was mentioned one time in the last sentence. So here we have this massively influential technology uh, introduced for uh, use across sectors, across industries, and in education, in our classrooms, right, even. Uh, but consent, uh, a concept that should truly be at the heart of all privacy policies in terms of service documents, was only mentioned once in the last sentence. Uh, now, since we performed this analysis again, right, for this talk that's being recorded, we see it up to six times. Um, that's a step in the right direction, um, certainly, but uh, there's probably still more work to do there. So I, <laughs> I like to turn it over and bring it much more locally. So OpenAI obviously is a big talking point. ChatGPT is a big talking point. But again, any kind of interaction with technology produces data and that data needs to have some kind of protections around it, um, including privacy policy. So Texas A&M uh, University Commerce. We do not have an individual privacy policy for our campus. Instead, the privacy policy is through the system, as well as directives that come from a few different um, offices on campus. Uh, students at A&M Commerce are governed by the privacy policy. It outlines purpose, 
personal information collected and legal basis. So what are they collecting, why are they collecting, and the justification for collecting. Um, and some of the privacy policies that we'd be really interested to see how they interlock with a general policy like this would be looking at not only the systems, but also the technologies promoted and allowed in the system. So Microsoft, for example, we all have access to Office uh, Outlook. Outlook 360. Um, D2L, Duo, Turnitin, Zoom, other third-party technologies. Thinking about how these technologies that are entities outside themselves, how do they mesh with the work that um, our system and our college says that we do to protect user privacy. And kind of just to add on one point to this is this is not an uncommon practice at the, in educational institutions. Think about the Texas RAMP standards, right? That we have to, to adhere to with the different third parties that we that we use and, and tools like DocuSign or mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one that I was on the Qualtrics. Line? Qualtrics, week, right? Like uh, Temporally, this week, we just got uh, an email talking about the migration of Qualtrics to a safer um, domain. Uh, precisely because of third-party access to data. And so we can see, even in real time, that these do shift, often in what I would say is a better direction, um, especially with programs like um, Texas Ramp. Um, but, you know, this is why we have to pay attention to these so that we know, oh, my data is protected or more protected now. Maybe I have to go back and make sure other things are better protected. <laughs> So not being complicit, apathetic, apathetic, and building privacy literacies. We argue that teachers must resist the urge to be complicit with surveillance pedagogies and injuries to student privacy. That means doing things like thinking about our framework in relation to uh, the assignments that you create and maybe having students investigate some of those. It means being conscious of the technologies that you integrate into your classroom and, and to what end. We encourage working with students to identify surveillance apathy while also considering the privacy paradox, which is about giving away some privacy to gain something which is usually framed as a convenience. In our classes, we use our classes to build privacy literacies with students as we co-navigate various technologies, including these emerging AI technologies we've talked about and other established educational technologies uh, like Duo, or not Duo, like D2L. Yeah, and the that last point about uh, talking about privacy and AI and data collection is something that our, our friend Anderson from the library also talks about in their presentation, which is really thinking about AI as something that does not take into account copyright, and yeah. so like putting that in and letting students put copyrighted material into an AI potentially opens a lot of people up to liabilities. Yeah. And really is not only a legal question, but a question of intellectual property, who gets to decide where their, their research goes. Does, you know, does the researcher get to decide or does the person looking at the research get to decide, okay, I'm gonna now submit this to this giant corpus bank of data that no one can actually ever disentangle yeah. because these models, these um, AI models, especially the large language models like ChatGPT, they're working with millions and millions and millions and millions of documents and data. So there's no way to ever disentangle that work. Okay. I think Anderson calls it a, a, a data black box. Mm -hmm. You don't know who put it in and you might not be able to get it out. <laughs> so uh, when we're thinking about privacy literacies, and this is something we've been writing about in our recent um, recent piece, um, we literally just put, we just finished it. <laughs> 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 um, and so what we've been thinking through is like, okay, 
well, what does it mean to like study privacy and surveillance in a field like rhetoric? And so we've been thinking through what, uh, what, what we know about privacy and surveillance and its implications through a rhetorical methodology. OK, and so we're not thinking about like, you know, Aristotle. Right. And we're not thinking necessarily about the rhetorical situation. Instead, we're thinking about social implicate social implications, economic implications, political implications, this cultural rhetorical approach to understanding uh, data collection, aggregation, and use. So we need to think through privacy culture and privacy in our culture, and we need to think, uh, work towards defining what it means to be privacy literate with our students. Mm -hmm. How can you talk to your students about this? We have given you a framework, and I'm sure right now it seems like a whole lot of stuff, and where do I put this in a semester? Right. Um, Charles, um, uh, Dr. Woods, joined the writing program um, at the beginning of the fall semester of 2023 to give us a short presentation and orientation to how privacy and discussions of privacy can be integrated into first year writing, for example. Um, potentially doing kind of rhetorical analysis or essays about the pri uh, issues of privacy. Yeah. You know, what is the privacy policy on your, on your favorite technology? How might you understand it? Across other disciplines, you might think still about those implications. You have to think about all of these questions of culture that move beyond um, the vacuum of course content. Because even though in our courses, we think that we have to focus on this specific thing, the way that we have students interact with that thing will have implications beyond the classroom. So what can happen in your classes and what can happen across campus? Leads us to the Digital Rhetorical Privacy Collective, which is uh, the drpcollective.com. It's a resource um, of adaptable assignments and activities for use across disciplines. So you can go here and pick up uh, digital resources, adaptable assignments, uh, blog posts, different content that you could work into your assignment to discuss uh, course through assignments and activities uh, or course content to discuss these issues. Uh, we put out a month, this is an organization that Dr. Johnson and I are part of. Uh, uh, we put out a monthly blog and a newsletter, um, you know, let's say every six weeks, not so, 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 say, say monthly, but we've been picking up the work that we've been doing at this project because sure, it uh, comes from, it's been, we've been around for a couple of years now, building out of this work, this real interest in privacy and surveillance in our field and rhetoric, it's, it's, it's near the top of the list. Um, so we got a grant, uh, we got a grant funded project uh, from the, I'm sorry, we got a grant to develop a grant-funded project from 4Cs NCTE. So NCT is the National Council of Teachers of English, the, the leading organization in our field. Cs is the major the national flagship conference in our field, gave us money to put on Privacy Week 2024, which is an inter-institutional effort uh, that originates here at Texas A&M Commerce that to discuss um, issues of privacy and surveillance in digital, but also non-digital uh, uh, contexts. Uh, and so we have folks, from University of Maryland, Utah State, here in Texas, um, and other places uh, who will all have panels, workshops, all kinds of stuff about privacy and surveillance and talking about those things in our communities and our culture coming up in January. We're really excited about that. Um, we have a monthly office hour. So if you're sitting in the and you're like, this is cool. Yeah, but I have no idea how I'm going to implement this mm. into my art class or into my, you know, engineering class, right, or whatever. Come by an office hour. We have them uh, usually monthly and promote them on our websites. And then the last thing, this is a new thing that we got this academic year. We put in building on our grant funded project. We put in um, an application for a presidential graduate, a GAR, presidential graduate research assistant. And we're awarded that position, which we are excited about because it shows an investment in this important topic at the institutional level, right? So please check out the DRPC. I didn't really do a good job of selling how invested we are in it. Like I founded it. Dr. Johnson's <laughs> on the advisory board. We have a collection of scholars around the world working on this topic. Uh, we can maybe edit that to the front. <laughs>
And that's the end of uh, the scripted presentation. We're happy to take questions, uh, go back and work through some things that we might have moved too fast through, but um, yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So um, we don't have one scheduled. We had one last week. On election day. On election day. It was super cool. We had like an hour long where we put together maybe a 10 minute presentation as a group on like privacy and surveillance on election day, right? So it was a themed office hour to talk about that. And so we didn't have a, a we don't have another one scheduled for December. This is the end of the, end of the term. Uh, but let's talk, get on our email list, right? And uh, we'll get you, get you to an office hour. We'll probably be back regularly in January. Or right. February. Yeah. And, you know, Privacy Week originates on our campus, so uh, there'll be opportunities to get with us there, too. So thinking about um, a couple slides ago, you were talking about privacy policies and with the TAMU system mm -hmm. and outside third party. Since we are an Adobe campus, where does that come in? <laughs> Oh, that article we just finished. <laughs> um, it directly contends with that question. Yeah. So really what we have to think about is, you know, Adobe is a third party. So the same question that we're posing here of how do um, our policies and third party policies integrate um, is a major question that we need to investigate more. And what I think is particularly interesting about Adobe is that Adobe and the Creative Campus is very proud of um, their, their privacy right. frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really interesting to see what they are guaranteeing to our campuses in really interesting ways. Um, and also thinking about, again, that uh, privacy paradox about what data are we okay giving to have um, to have access to something like the Adobe Suite. And so I think to build on this, it becomes a an, an IP issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like how can we uh, teach an undergraduate class where they're using these Adobe tools and creating images or creating sounds or whatever you know platform or product Adobe product that they're using. Um, how can we get them to do that knowing that that data that they're producing, they don't own and, and Adobe is then using to train their AI? How are we making apparent to students that they're contributing right to this and then untangling or detangling the ethical stuff as we go? So then that's a similar consideration if they're, you've got an instructor who's using or quote unquote teaching their students to use chat. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a third party, yeah. um, but the difference there is that it does, we, you can't fall back on the protections of the campus because... Whereas Adobe can. Right, right, because we're in a partnership with Adobe as opposed to ChatGPT, which would be ad hoc unless at some point we enter that kind of agreement. But as of right now, yeah, it's... That would be an individual professor bringing in an individual technology. Which requires, which deserves yeah. scrutinization, certainly. Yes. Yeah. We encourage other questions if you've got them. We also want to point out that um, privacy and surveillance, we often take it from this very like negative side. There are a lot of really important pieces that we think about and a lot of benefits that are necessary. Um, the data that we get about diversities on campus, thinking about which students we should target to help uh, lift them up and retain them here at the university, that's all a form of surveillance. That's all a form of you know, tracking, but it's not a form of tracking in the same kind of malicious manner of I'm taking your data and I'm selling it to unknown <laughs> fourth party. Yeah. Can you explain what the literacy day is? Oh, the, 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 privacy, the week. privacy week. Um, so, um, 
It's a week in January, and this is National Privacy Week, so it's a kind of large scale um, international international data um, privacy week. So we just coordinated with that. Yeah. And with our DRPC collective, we have um, scholars here. We have scholars at University of Maryland. We have scholars at Utah State and Birmingham in New York. And on each of those campuses, we're going to have privacy and surveillance related programming. So um, guest lectures, uh, speakers, uh, some hands-on workshops for some stuff. Um, and really just giving these different communities um, access and sharing resources in a way that um, we not, no one campus could do by themselves. Yeah. So yeah. instead of having one guest speaker, we now have five guest speakers across all the campuses. Um, and the big point of Privacy Week is really um, an introductory education. We're really seeing it as a public-facing um, tool, we hope to also think about um, publics beyond our campus, so really thinking about um, the community around us and what can we do to support that community as well. That's what's so cool about our group of scholars that we work with at the DRPC is that we come to privacy and surveillance studies from different perspectives. And so we have different interests. And so while I might be interested in wearables and biometric technologies, um, Dr. Johnson and maybe some of our other scholars might be more interested in some of the cultural stuff, right? Uh, and some of the less digital or technical stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, our, um, our event at the University of Maryland is really going to focus in on how black women are surveilled, right? Uh, and then our event at, uh, in uh, Massachusetts is going to focus on like sur is surveillance and the Navy, right? Because it's at a mar maritime academy. Which we lovingly call surveillance on the sea. Right. And so <laughs> here at Texas, we're going to focus, uh, focus uh, more so on, um, it's a keynote here because since we are kind of the hub for the DRPC. And they're gonna focus on privacy, defining it privacy in the field and then the community. So it's a really local, local approach for DFW for yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that question, because I didn't yeah. do a good job of explaining it earlier. <laughs> so it's all gonna be like Zoom connected? So yeah. Yep. Yes. And you should be seeing stuff. Uh, the GAR that we have is doing some awesome work raising our profile on social media and all kinds of stuff related to that. And so um, you should see some stuff soon. And uh, certainly uh, folks in literature and languages and CAS uh, will get listserv information soon too. Um, who, who is the GAR so that I don't throw stuff away on my email just without? You'll get it from me. Uh, I would argue every, everywhere. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll see it everywhere, but I think the writing part administrator should answer that question. <laughs> um, the project that um, Dr. Woods presented and kind of the, the first level project that we talked about is a rhetorical analysis, um, which could slot very well into 1301. That already, the new curriculum of 1301 includes a rhetorical analysis you would just work with students to plug that topic in. So that's plug and go. Um, thinking in terms of other classes, thinking in terms of um, English 100 or English 1302 or even classes outside of our department, um, we really think that you should think about these terms in relation to the content and yeah. in relation to your discipline. So we come from a, a, a rhetorical in writing studies background, so we feel much more comfortable talking about this in rhetorical and writing studies. Um, how a computer scientist or how a biologist is thinking about this, because they have data to protect too. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> they have really important research data that they want to protect. So I think those kinds of conversations need, a, need to be had. Um, and how you do that, I, we would like to help, we'd like to consult, um, but we would also work with the content experts. How would this fit into your field? How would this fit into your class? As opposed to saying, well, everyone do rhetorical analysis because sure. that's not appropriate for every class. And when we even, to extend that, you know, I teach in the writing program, right? And so 
a, a lot of those assignments are revolve around discussing and understanding literacy, literacy development. And so I think introducing a concept like privacy literacies coalesces really well with that curriculum. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, students, when they submit papers for a grade or something for class, don't have copyrights on that. Um, but I read an article online oh, less than six weeks ago about some big name authors that are joining the Writers Guild mm -hmm. in a legal dispute against OpenAI. Yeah, very similar to what we've seen with SAG-AFTRA in the yeah. last six months. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so they're saying that AI is coming up with novels and putting mm -hmm. the author's mm -hmm. name on it. And there's one author that said that there are several books on Amazon that she has supposedly written that right. she didn't write. Obviously, the genie's out of the bottle. We're not going to be able to put it back in. But is there is this part of the growing pains going through the legal aspects and definitions, and then figuring out from there what's going to happen? Absolutely, our yeah. infrastructure does not know how to handle this yet because it is a new thing. Yeah. Um, you know, we're really AI is not a new technology, but ChatGPT launched less than a year ago. <laughs> And it has completely changed all of the conversation. Um, so really, yes, it is going to be a figuring out, seeing how things run. Um, Site after just uh, announced their tentative agreement, which includes uh, guardrails and guidelines for AI um, reproduction of actors' appearance and voice. And so, you know, we might see more cultural work as well as um, political legal work coming yeah. as these organizations start to navigate what this means and what this looks like. And I think that I don't want to, I'm not going to try to make some, you know, large, overly large statement here, but like this is going to be a pressing issue for our, our society, you know, uh, in this moment going forward, like contending with privacy and surveillance continuum in the digital sphere within the frame of AI is something that we're going to have to talk about regardless of which college you're teaching in, regardless of if you're if on you're a college campus, teaching, you know, college. yeah, exactly. Uh, pushing us to the secondary realm or just into different <laughs> publics, you know, yeah. uh, this, this is, this is part of the conversation going forward. And we really, really need to highlight that we are in the, still in the early days of, of, of teasing out AI's influence, not just on writing and the humanities, but everything. Um, yeah. And so I think I will end that brief soapbox with, <laughs> since it is going to be an issue that we must contend with, we must put consent at the heart of our privacy policies. And think critically about what um, intellectual property and ownership means. Yeah. Um, because the question of well, a student doesn't have a formal copyright on something, does not negate a student's ownership of their intellectual property. Right. Not that you were implying that. Um, but it's an issue that we have to directly think about because what are we, um, where are we allowing that to go? What, um, how is that data being collected? And data being the writing or the metadata about the writing. Um, so, those kinds of questions are the kind of questions that we're really interested in. The metadata about the writing. What a great way, what a great point, you know? Where the writing occurs matters. Well, yeah, because... The data collection. Yeah, because like tools and functions out of a, a program like Word, for example, that's focusing on metadata. How long does it take for someone to compose a thing? What tools would make that faster or slower or this or that? So it's not just, you know, here in the English studies realm, We've, we've heard a lot about like creative writing or scholarly writing, um, and we haven't necessarily thought about the things that talk about our writing to companies, which is actually much more valuable than any essay that I write individually, because all of this data is aggregated into a, just a giant pot. 
Um, so like my one little essay, they don't care about it. Now, a million essays, they care about that. And a million essays that also have millions and millions of metadata points, they really care about that. Great point. 